What is going on, family? It is your boy Low Daddy back again with another episode of Teach Us Something Cool. Now, Teach Us Something Cool, it's like a book club, but for learning cool shit. We do that every single Wednesday night at 8.30 p.m. Central Standard Time over on Clubhouse. It's an invite-only app. If you need an invite, leave a comment below. I'm happy to share the wealth with you if I have any invites this week at my disposal. Um, you know, basically every single week we have a new topic set by uh, the panel and set by our community over on Discord. If you want to join that, click on the link tree description below, uh, and you can join it in there for free. Recommend some future topics for us to discuss, but basically we get experts on any given topic, come in, and they enlighten us. They teach us something cool every single week so we'd love to see y'all there in the future i hope y'all enjoy the video and this week's topic is on whatever the title of the video is below and as always please 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 smash that like button smash smash just smash that subscribe button and a ring the little bell next to it so that you get notified every time we go live every time we drop new videos and new episodes on here which should be at least once a week uh if not more in the future and as always please 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 if you really like this video leave a comment below we'd love to hear from y'all hope y'all enjoy yeah so what's up everybody this is teach us something cool to today we're talking about language um this conversation will be recorded so don't say anything that you don't want to be on the internet uh we're also going to be posting in the discord throughout this conversation so if you haven't joined yet feel free to jump in and i'm going to pass it on over to mike to give a little background on what's gonna go down yeah so i mean this is a topic that you know, I think a lot of people think about it at some point in their lives, but they never take the time to really go and explore and discover, you know, how language came about. Because at some point, you know, something had to start moving when we go from just, you know, apes to to speaking. You know, that's the, t the purpose of the topic title here, right? You know, from cavemen, which is, you know, the Homo erectus, which is really where language started, as some hypothesize. Um, you know, Carson... Uh, we're lucky to have on the panel tonight. He wrote his thesis on the evolution of language. So this is actually the perfect discussion for him to be a part of. Um, and he's going to have a ton of info that, you know, I think is going to be valuable to all of y'all. Um, but yeah, going all the way from the Homo erectus and cavemen um, to today where we got, like I said in my Instagram stories, the youngsters shouting stuff like, oh, my dude valid, my dude sturdy. You know, it had to evolve or it had to start somewhere and the evolution from there and the mutations that happened throughout history Um was something that was really fascinating to explore this week. Uh, Carson, do you want to give a quick intro every, uh, to everyone in the audience about, uh, I guess, what you wrote your thesis on? Um, and yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Mike. Um, I think just to make a distinction, the, the thesis that I wrote was about the evolution of the spoken word in the spoken language. So, like, I started my thesis on cuneiform which is the first original written language right if you don't know that's strings being tied in knots in certain forms dipped into ink and drawn across paper so just the most you know <laughs> incredibly difficult and specific way to write language um, that's where i start in, in order to have a history or a fact of where language came from but Really, that's because that's the furthest we can draw to, right? We, we can fantasize and, and theorize about uh, where cavemen came from and, and, and how they spoke, but um, cuneiform is really how we started in, in the land of Ur. So um, beginning there as, you know, kind of a base point in data for language and then basing off of that and going into spoken word, that's kind of where I you know, launched my, my thesis from and all the way to the technological era of how language has changed. Um, and I think, you know, the examples that you gave are, are very pertinent for um, where I ended my thesis on is, is how we've come to this point of shortened language and, and you know, abbreviated word. Um, and, and I think that's really given way to, you know, kind of the digital era. So uh, excited to talk about all of it, but um, you know, <laughs> that's that's basically what I covered is, is spoken word to now the, the texting and the, the instant messaging and even, you know, video gaming um, language. Yes, that, that's awesome. You said it's called cuneiform? Yeah, cuneiform was the original written language. Um, and it was basically strings. And I think the, the original form of cuneiform was 11 different strings fixed to a post. And then within that post, those 11 different strings were knotted 
in different ways. So imagine, you know, writing hello, but the word hello, you know, the fourth string had three knots on it and the seventh string had two knots on it lower than the first knot on the fourth string. You know what I mean? Like it was mm-hmm. incredibly complicated. It was almost smarter than today uh, in the way that they had to figure out how to, uh, how to record language. Yeah. Um, really quick, Connor, can you look up a good link for that and throw it in the Discord for anyone who wants to um, read up on it? Because I definitely want to pull something on my end. I've never heard of that until now. How long ago did that um, language? I got that written language. Can you inform how how long ago was that? I guess evidence found of uh, that language. Yeah, cuneiform spelled C U N E I F O R M. Um, again, that was back in. Appreciate that. Yeah, back in you know the the three thousands of BCE, that was mm-hmm. was a long time ago. Basically, uh, Sumerians, right? The land of Ur mm-hmm. um, of Mesopotamia. That's how they how they developed a way to record rules and and communication. And then that's then you get into uh, you know that's the transition of there is the the Hammurabi code where they you know, transcribed rules of law onto stone tablets, but it all came from not time. Gotcha. And so I always thought it was pronounced cuneiform, but that's just me. You know what? We're talking about language, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, Pronounce it how you will. They have been dead for thousands of years. And so you said that was about 3000 BC, right, Carson? And so uh, the really interesting thing that I found when, when, you know, researching this topic this week is there's a lot of people that have a lot of different theories as to when language officially began, right? And one of the most interesting that I, um, well, there's two really that stood out among among the rest of them. Um, You know, one of the guys, his name is Michael Corbalis. He's a... um, professor in the Department of Psych at the University of Auckland. Uh, He's got a pretty good TED Talk on it. Um, But as far as origins of language go, there was another one I found that I'll be citing a lot throughout this. His name is Dan Everett. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but um, he is the trustee professor of cognitive languages at Bentley University in uh, Massachusetts. And so his, uh, they both agree that it started um, with the Homo erectus for the most part, right? Um, Which are, for anyone unfamiliar with that, that's the cavemen. Uh, and basically, you know, I'll I'll get to it. I'm going to go more in depth later on as I kind of explain what I found. Uh, they find that there, you need to have two parts to a layer to have a language. You need to have, um, symbols and grammar is what it comes down to. And so all they need to do is like, if they can make two sounds, they argue, uh, that's all you need to have a language. Um, and so it was really fascinating. I, I think there's a link already in the Discord if anyone wants to see it. Anyone who's not in the Discord already, by the way, just do a quick tap on um, my profile uh, or teach us something cool's profile. It's just going to lead you right back to uh, my profile anyway. So I'll save you one step. Go to my profile, click on either my Twitter or my Instagram. You don't have to follow me. It's not a big deal. But the link to the Discord is in there. Free Discord. going to be useful links throughout this whole discussion, uh, including those videos I'm citing as well. Um, so... Go ahead. Mike, sorry to... No, no, you're good. Go ahead. Going into what you were talking about with the distinction between grammar and uh, kind of vocabulary, if you will, uh, what I've read in a lot of the medical journals is that actually it's... Dis- I believe it's designed that way uh, or it's distinguished that way because the brain has two different types of... Uh, aphasia is the technical term for um, loss of... Uh, understanding of language. There is uh, one that involves lexicon, the other that involves grammar. Uh, Essentially, one that involves the actual physical vocabulary that is forgotten, and the other that uh, cannot recall sentence structure. So that's kind of why that distinction happens, and it's based off, to my understanding, it's based off of the brain's capabilities. I'm not sure I follow completely. There's a lot of terms that my brain just could not follow. Yeah, um, so I'm, I'm looking at something. It's a behavioral neurology journal from 2015, and <clears throat> there's two major types of aphasic syndromes. There's Wernicke's type and Broca's type aphasia. Aphasia is the fancy medical term for um, 
lack uh, loss of language uh, so amnesia of language uh, let me verify that before i put that on the record but aphasia yeah loss of ability to understand or express speech caused by brain damage um <clears throat> so I, I think that's where the distinction comes in as you were talking about but i, I want to hear more about uh dan everett because i definitely saw his name in a few of the articles that i was reading oh yeah super super fascinating guy sorry carson uh if you wanted to say something you can no, no worries yeah, I was just going to say, super fascinating guy. You know, he's got a TED Talks about 20 minutes long. Uh, I've watched it a few times all the way through just to make sure I could absorb what he was um, uh, lecturing on. Um, but, yeah, he's the one. He, he pretty much credits it all to the Homo erectus, and they were, you know, a pretty phenomenal species uh, coming right before us. I was trying to look up before this really quick if we coexisted with them at any point. It looks like we did for maybe a little bit. But, um yeah, he, he, he breaks it down to that, and uh, the grammar and symbols is what it really comes down to, where they had tools, and there was evidence of, like, uh, them starting to travel and starting to expand where they were living. So, like, for one example, I think it's called the Island of Flores, which is modern-day Indonesia, and in order to go from where they had been uh, known to have derived from, uh, there they needed to have boats because the currents around that island are, you know, if not the strongest, some of the strongest currents in the entire world. Uh, so no one would have been able to swim there. So it tells us that they needed to be able to make boats and they needed to know how to make tools and plan and whatnot. And in order to plan, you got to have a language of some kind, of some type. Um, so it's like planning, imagination, and then I forget what the uh, third characteristic he says is give me one second it's um yeah planning imagination and hierarchical thoughts so if this then that essentially um so that's how that you know that's his evidence of uh homo erectus being where language derived from uh, but yeah dan everett super fascinating guy he's been studying language for 40 years like as he's learned uh, in the Amazon rainforest, uh, with, from one of their tribes, I think it's like the Pinyan, uh, like the Pinyaha tribe, um, and their language consists of 12 sounds. So, uh, yeah, very credible guy when it comes to language. But you know, like I said, I encourage you all to go watch that video, and you know, watch it, rewatch it, and rewatch it again because it's just full of just very, very, uh, I guess, substantial knowledge. <laughs> yeah. I think that the the theory there of like making it about twelve. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't recall what tribe it was you said or what group it says, uh, what group he said it was. Um, but that theory is largely uh, contested as the, one of the leading primary theories that, uh, of how Homo erectus began producing language was it began to mimic sounds that were common. For example, crackle, snap of fire, the bang of you know two things that. Chink, chink, chink of like metal hit a rock hitting rock, metal hitting metal at the time. Um, but I, that's absolutely on par from everything I've found as well. It, it's very unique too because um, also I was looking at the American Anthropology Association and there's so many weird, uh, I, I shouldn't say weird, but so many unique things, theories that go into these uh, these thoughts, such as humans at the time, Homer, Homer I just had emotions. So as the human brain had developed, its emotional interjections became associated with gestures. And I mean, there's more and more, the list goes on, but it's very uh, interesting. If you guys are interested in following along, I posted the link in the Discord probably, uh, I think it was Monday night. Um, definitely worth go take, going to take a look at. Yes. Sorry, go ahead, Connor. No worries. Yeah, I think uh, Everett mentions that these uh, cavemen essentially had imagination. Um, they planned out their attacks when hunting and um, all that good stuff. So, you know, I was thinking about it. Um, the history of the written word came about in 3500 BC, and like language is basically the wheel as to the book is the car you know you can't have the the wheel the, the car without the wheels so we just you know snowballed so quickly i mean it did take a couple thousand years but once they started writing stuff down and understanding um literary elements it started to compound and it's amazing how our brain works right um if tomorrow a uh, a baby was born and everybody disappeared or two babies were born and everybody disappeared they would just 
and given that they were fed, like could nutri- uh, like get nutrients and stuff, they would have no idea what's going on because everything's taught from the people around you. Right. And that, uh, that's actually, um, I guess, going to where, where Travis, uh, I guess, left us and piggybacking off of you too, Connor. That's um, from Michael Corbalis's, um TED Talk where he talks about uh, I think I think you mentioned gestures, right, Travis? Uh, he he defines that as like how language evolved, where it started as um, hand gestures, where where monkeys like the the term monkey see, monkey do, comes about is like they're they're good at mirroring, and mirroring is like a, a good sales tactic or good negotiating tactic that you'll see from like guys like Chris Voss. Um, he preaches it, but they learn to mirror each other, and so they would gesture things with their hands. Um, for you know whatever they wanted, very simple thoughts and you know monkeys you can like they've they couldn't teach a, a monkey to speak ever because they don't have the right vocal structure um, or layering structure, but they were able they've been able to teach monkeys and gorillas how to use sign language. Um, you know they can say like very basic sentences with it, but they're good at at hand gestures and so from there it derived or it evolved into um, facial gestures. So you know just making certain uh, or having certain mannerisms of your face and communicating whether you're happy or you're displeased or whatever, um, you know, we still use those today, obviously. And then eventually language, this is Michael Corbalis's theory, is that it went from your face to your mouth, where people started communicating in tongues, um, you know, just kind of moving their tongue, however, you know, making whatever sounds, you know, come out at that time. And then eventually, you know, actual um, structured language starts to uh, or it starts to evolve into actual structured language, but it all started with gestures. So what you said was exactly correct, Travis. Yeah, um, that's that's what I was reading as well. That anthropology, uh, American Anthropology Organization article that I found, uh, it, it was stating that the grunts and gestures had evolved into uh, what became a uh, written and or pictorial language, much like Carson was talking about. Um, I think cartons might have been quite a bit more advanced than, you know, the uh, pictures of saber-toothed tigers and mammoths that, you you know, you've seen in uh, children's movies. But um, it evolved into that once those images and or gestures pointing towards objects were associated, um, those nouns, two nouns being put together, uh, essentially create your very, very bare bones basic sentence structure. And once that had been kind of ingrained and widely used throughout culture at the time, uh, that was when the human brain started to really grow. The human brain grew <clears throat> in not only size, but in shape and internal structure and allowed it to then be able to understand grammatical sentence structure or uh, as it reads here, um, I believe it's syntime, S-Y-N-T-A-G-M, two or more linguistic elements that occur sequentially in the chain of speech and have a specific relation. So uh, as those two objects were put together, uh, that's how the brain really started to take off, and it's it's incredible where it goes from there. Yeah, uh, really, really quick before we, I'm going to let you uh, answer that, Connor, but just quick room reset, anyone who's joining in now, um, you know, we're talking, obviously, based on the topic you see here on the origins of language. Uh, we've been discussing pretty much, you know, the Homo erectus, the cavemen so far. We will kind of progress through there as well. Uh, but, yeah, if you want to join our club, click that little greenhouse at the top. Just go ahead and, um, you know, follow us. Uh, if you want to follow any of the moderators up here, we will follow you back. Uh, and then if you ever want to add anything or you want to ask any questions, you can do so by just raising your hand below. We'll call you up to the stage. We'll have a cue building throughout the conversation. And if you don't feel like talking, you, you know, some people have said they don't want to sound stupid on stage. One, you can't sound stupid on here. I sound like an idiot the entire time. I'm okay with it. You got to be okay with it too. Um, I'm talking on topics that I'm not necessarily entirely familiar with, but if you don't, for whatever reason, feel confident enough or you just don't want to waste time talking on stage, hop in the Discord, go to my bio, follow the links or the instructions in there, join our Discord, and just ask a question in there. We can ask it for you. So with that being said, Connor, go ahead and you can uh, say whatever you're going to say. Yeah, it's actually a quick build off of what you said earlier, Mike. Um, the fact that we teach um, apes and gorillas and monkeys sign language so they can communicate and it effectively works. There's a story about a gorilla. Her name was Coco. And when she was passing away, she actually signed that 
human beings need to, you know, clean up their act, basically, with the environment, and that every animal on the planet watches us, which totally blows my mind, and, and you don't really think that you're communicating with everything, birds, insects, fish, but every every organism, basically, um, effectively has uh, the ability to communicate, whether it be on a micro level or a macro level. Uh, I thought that was pretty prolific in, in communication, and the fact that we are the winners in this battle for um, the hierarchy is amazing that we are where we are today. Absolutely. Uh, that's, that's actually a pretty crazy story. Um, you know, I knew the new sign language. I've heard about Coco before, but, you know, to think that all the animals in the, in, the, in the world are watching us and they're just, like, disgusted with our actions kind of tells you something, but... Yeah, I mean, like, the fact that she said it, I mean, how hard is it to teach a gorilla to sign those exact... Like, you know, there's a gray area for sure. Somebody could have just taught the gorilla to say that, but... If it's, you know, true and this gorilla actually meant what uh, she signed, it's um, mind-blowing mind that she comprehended that the other animals are watching. Therefore, we should understand they're watching and we should know with our actions, like, what we're communicating to these animals. <laughs> Essentially, just like the, the Greta Thunberg of, uh, of gorillas. Tobin's about to whip in here and hopefully not blow up everything I just said. Tobin, what's <laughs> going on, brother? <laughs> no, so I, I actually know very little on kind of the history of language. But I, um, when I, while I studied in college, I um, had two disciplines, biology and philosophy. And my philosophy department is very classical, um, and it very much came up, especially with me, because the biologist I was talking about, oh, well, you know, because all these classical um, philosophers are, oh, we're, we're the animal of language, we're the animal of speech, and, you know, no other animal has it. And then, like, Coco the gorilla, that was what I brought up, and, you know, just other animals, whales, they sing to each other and stuff. But it's really interesting, and probably out of the scope of this discussion, but um, if you look up... Uh, like Lichtenstein is probably the most famous um, linguistic philosopher. It's very different how they define language. Uh, so communication and language are different. You know, like Lichtenstein would not deny that animals can communicate, but whether communication constitutes language is a completely different argument. And then, so my, my professor and I honestly, unfortunately, I don't remember most of it, but he absolutely dismantled the Coco the Gorilla example as, as an example of language. And I, I just think it was really interesting. But that's another angle to look at it is kind of the philosoph philosophical one that, i.e., does, does language, are language and communication the same or is, or is there a difference? Well, that, that's something that um, I think it's Dan Everett who... who uh, shines light on the difference there, right? Where we're all um, species, they communicate in some way. It's just that for the most part, hu our homo sapiens, humans, are the only ones who we have evident, like real substantial evidence that we have had language for pretty much, I think, our entire existence. Um, he does make the argument, though, that it went back to the Homo erectus, and the only way that they classify between communicating and between language is that we're not only making sounds, it's that our sounds have um, substance to them. So it's just grammar, and I'm going to pull up my notes really quick of how he defines it, because he says that there's two things you need for a language. Um, symbols and grammar, and the symbols are defined as this, and they make total sense. Um, you know, ask me if you need me to elaborate as well. But it, a symbol, it, it's made from th three steps, essentially. The first is an index, right? And an index are things like you smell smoke, so there must be a fire. You know, smoke equal, or is the index of fire, or the indicator, essentially, um, or footprints. You see a footprint, someone must have been here. Um, then the second, that comes from that is an icon so that would be things like the mona lisa or um the cross when it first originated um i mean the, the, what what 
comes from icons that they turn into symbols eventually. And that's when an icon, something like the Mona Lisa or the cross, has a meaning attached to it, right? So, uh, or cultural meaning attached to it. So the cross, obviously, has Christianity attached, attached to it. You see a cross, you associate Christianity or Catholicism with it. Um, now, this doesn't have to be something as strong as that. It could be something like he gives an example of uh, a shovel, right? We, we know that they had some sort of language or they had symbols at the very least because they had tools that they had been crafting, whether it be a stone, um, they had iterations, like they had their MVP tools, the minimal, minimum viable product for anyone not familiar with that term. Um, and then they've got, you know, their V2, they've got their V3, where it's just like they're crafting it to be better for use. And then they had spears, like wooden spears that they were carving and they didn't have one kind of spear they had um, they had spears that they designed for throwing. They had spears that they had designed for thrusting. And so, like, you know, you're taking a 150-pound caveman, giving him a thrusting spear, and you're telling him to go stab, um, yeah, what is it? What's the the big elephant's called? Not the, um, not the woolly mammoth. Not the woolly mammoth. Like the, was it Mangalon? Megalodon. Megalodon, yeah. That's a shark. Megalodon. Mastodon. Mastodon. <laughs> Good. Yeah, I, I didn't go to college for animals, so thank you guys. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, he, he says that they had tools, right? And their tools, like, we know that they had some sort of meaning to them, because one, we see a shovel, we associate labor with that, we use it to dig, and they thought the same thing, like, this tool is used for hunting. Um, and we know that they had more meaning to them as well, because certain people who were highly respected in their tribes, when we found any of their remains, some of them were, were buried with certain tools, right? So establishing a higher meaning there. So that's the first thing that you need for a language, you need symbols. Um, so if anyone needs clarification there, you know, feel free, speak up, ask me a question, and I'll try my best to answer it. But then from there, you need grammar. And so he just, he says grammar can be broken down into three, um, three, I guess, sub subtopics here. You've got your G1, you got G2, and then he says very creatively, G3. So G1, it just means that grammars are in linear order. So it's just your words are in order. So for example, um, we know you drink, you drive, you go to jail, or no shoes, no shirt, no service. Um, so even today, there are certain like Indonesian tribes that have this G1 grammar level, and that's what their language is, but that's all they need for it to consist or to make a language. They need grammar, they need symbols. Now, G2 is like one step further where it's like it has a hierarchical structure to it. So you take words, like those same words, and you can just make a larger sentence with them. So for example, if you drink and you drive, then you go to jail. You know, it's a little more complex. And then the third one is just it's G3. So it's got hierarchy to it, and then it also has recursion. So we're just throwing a bunch of words in there and elaborating on the thoughts. So very, you know, the English language is this. What I'm doing right now is this. Uh, so if you drink and you drive, and you know that really you really shouldn't do that because your girlfriend hates when you do that, and she said she's never going to give you bond money again and bail you out of jail for getting another DUI, and so on and so on. That's G3 grammar. You're just, you got a bond. It's a very, very evolved language. So that's grammar. The first thing we described was symbols. He argues that you only need grammar and you need symbols and that's what makes up a language and that's what sets us apart from um, just being able to communicate like every other species does. Isn't it interesting that we kind of glom onto the simple stuff that makes us go like, ah, oh, yeah, that makes sense, right? Like, for example, OJ, um, if the glove don't fit, you must acquit. That literally got a murderer through the trial because the whole jury just stood there and was like oh yeah that makes sense all right that was it like that was that was the that was the dagger line so well now you're getting into symbiotics and, and things that rhyme <laughs> help with your time i mean that's you know <laughs> that changes that changes everything that that you know that has to do with anything right that's well i'm certainly it's part of language but but being able to appeal to a you know jury in, in an appellate court you know that's that's a whole other discussion but right yeah. i think um <laughs> no i was just gonna say to, to jump in here um mike and, and certainly everything that you you know purported is not part of you know your thesis or, or anything that you put out into the world i think um as somebody who's studied language it, it bothers me to say that you know lexicon or, or symbols are what define a society like there are 
I guess I don't mean for it to get into an entire cultural discussion or, or societal implication or whatever, but it draws my mind to the swastika, right? These days, anyone in the last 200, not even 150 years would say the swastika is a symbol of evil and a symbol of death and slavery and blah, 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 internment, you know, whatever. However, swastika came from Sanskrit, right? Originally, it's from Hindu, and it, and it meant the sun. It, it meant prosperity and good luck and well-being. You know, I mean, to think of it as evil and death is such a new thing, right, in, in our history as, as a humanity, as a society. So to say that uh, symbols define our culture, and I understand being able to communicate and, and being able to have language, that's one thing. But to say that symbols define, you know, who we are or they are completely agreed upon, there are, you know, religions or, or cultures around the world, especially ones that are, you know, deprived of technology and history that would really rely on, for example, the swastika and would say, mm -hmm. <laughs> they would see that symbol and think, oh, good things to come. You know what I mean? <laughs> like in a, in a modern society, it's so, just let's say in the U.S., it's so weird to ever think of that symbol being natural or connected with peace and and you know a, a redirection to i don't know simpler living or, or mm -hmm. happiness or well-being right so <laughs> i think that's so hilarious i'm gonna let you finish your thought to uh j just the swastika part um slater can attest to this as well we were just with our boy vamsi the entire past week when i was in california and you know he's hindu and it, Basically, he was going on a rant about exactly what you said there, where it was, you know, swastika is Hindu, and the, yeah. you know Hitler took it, and now everyone associates it with, you know, the, these these bloodthirsty murder machine Nazis who killed Jews, gypsies, and you know anyone who wasn't Aryan, pretty much. And he's telling us it's actually it's not funny. I, I can laugh because I'm Jewish. You guys aren't allowed to laugh, but. Um, it's not funny. It's not funny. It's not funny. <laughs> but <laughs> um, he says that it's like something that they put on like the walls of their homes when they either first move in right. there or they first move out there. And it's supposed to be like a sign of like, I think you said like peace. And I think you, you, you said the rest of what it communicates. But I'm thinking it's, it's kind of funny to laugh at the thought of there being a lot of homes throughout our society just hidden with Indian people living in there with swastikas on the walls. And if anyone walked in there, they'd be like, what the fuck is going on in here? Yes. But, yeah. That would actually be hilarious. Dude, he said it's happening. He's no, like, it's, they it's put it on their homes. It's a perception of what that was, right? And that's, Mike, you said it perfectly. He stole what that meaning was. And, and you know, we can we could do an entire probably three weeks on Hitler and psychology. But oh, yeah. thinking of the psychological perception of, of what is a symbol mean to anybody, right? Like, you write a cross wrong or you, you put the, the horizontal line to censure, you know, <laughs> centrically, it, it looks like a plus sign. You know, it's, there, there is like a, a misidentification all the time with symbols and lexicon. So think of, you know, an alphabet, how it comes. Here's, here's another example. Let's, let's get off the swastika topic because mm -hmm. we could talk about that for two hours. Yeah. Um, to think of, here's, here's a funny thing. I don't, and again, I'm sorry. I, I had to drop off for 10 minutes. I'm, I'm back. I don't know if you talked about this. Oh dude, back you're bringing the heat. Days, what? I said, you're bringing heat. Keep it coming. Yeah, I'm bringing heat. I'm bringing heat. Get ready for this shit. Um, so back in the day when like, <laughs> this is, <laughs> let me, let me just simplify it. When you look at a TV show or a program or, or a movie and they go, oh, medieval times, and then their signs say, ye old tavern, blah, 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 right? Ye old tavern. The ye is Y-E. This is the dumbest and most simplified interpretation of language I've ever seen in my life as someone who studied language. Ye literally is just... A mistake they're saying ye as in ye but in old english if you were to google old english alphabet ye was a was a shorthand for th nobody ever out loud in the olden days quote unquote olden days said 
ye old tavern. They were writing the word the, the tavern. Ooh. But because of an oversimplification of, if you were to look, I, I mean, I wish I could like share my screen with you or, or show it to you. It looks like the, the ligature of, you know, the, the T and the H, it curls together. It looks like Y, but they're just literally writing the letters T-H. So it's one of those things where, you know, over the last, I don't know, 500 years, we've come accustomed to be like, well, we don't know what that means. Let's just pronounce it for what it looks like. And and we do. <laughs> and we say, ye old blah, blah, blah. But they they never talked like that. They never said things in that way. They said the, uh, just like we do today. I never knew that till now. Travis, yeah. sorry, I didn't cut you off. Yeah, I, I just want to go off of that. I love how language just has a ton of little quirks like that. I was reading the other day about how whenever the U.S. Um, split away from Britain, we just decided basically like, okay, well, since we're our own country now, we're just going to say fuck it and have our own spellings for a few words here and there. And so that's like why American English uh, is different than British English and words like color have an extra U in you know British English, but not American English. And it's literally just because we felt like we needed some clear, distinct differences, not for any good reason or because yeah. uh, it, it wasn't even like a natural kind of grassroots thing either. It was literally just, you know, some guy deciding, oh, we're going to do things differently now that we're independent. And it's just so fun right. to me how language just takes little twists and turns because of random historical events like that. Yeah. Well, it's all, it's all based on a, a complete like misunderstanding to your point and even just referencing what you just talked about a lot of people don't know this but and it's and it's really really hard to wrap your mind around the like if you look at the colonization of spanish countries like let's say you know south america and and let's say let's just say hispaniola right that's that's the island of Dominican Republic and Haiti split in half. The, the west side is Dominican Republic. The east side is Haiti. Haiti was colonized by the French. That's why they speak French. Uh, the the uh, Dominican Republic was colonized by the Spanish. That's why they speak Spanish. So I've been there three times. Um, it's very interesting. It's a lot of people who look African-American and like you would walk up to in, you know, an urban city and be like, what's up, man? And they don't speak any English. And they're like, it pasa away. You know, it's, it's very, it's like you're speaking to a Mexican person, but they look like they're from African descent. And there's a reason for that. But they, they come to different countries and that's all they speak. And the biggest slave trade on this side of the world was there. And even more historically, you know, Christopher Columbus did not do anything in the United States of America as it is today. He landed in Hispaniola. He established the first Christian church in the world or, or in the Western Hemisphere in the Dominican Republic. And that was his barter. That was his port for, for the slave trade. But interestingly enough, a lot of black people that speak Spanish there, um, thinking of the same thing, whereas they settled that they taught the language, you know, to those people, and then those people now speak that language, right? They brought Africans to that land. African people did not speak Spanish over time. Now they speak fluent Spanish more than they speak English or any other language. Um, coming to America, the English settled, you know, the, the Native Americans. The British people, which, again, very hard to wrap your mind around, they spoke a dialect that is more common to Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi than it is to Illinois or, you know, Indiana or you know, Iowa. the Midwestern countries or Iowa. Yeah, the, the Midwestern states that we think of, especially as people who live in the Midwest, that, you know, we speak very uh, affluently and, you know, we, <laughs> we're, we're, we sound almost like rich people compared to the South, right? And, and sometimes these days that's a whole other topic of the language compared to where you live. Um, it is very comparatively not at all what people in Britain sounded like. And if you were to compare what people in the Midwest sound like right now, how I speak to you right now, compared to how people sound in the South these days, 
not y'all necessarily, but long drawls and, and, and elongated verbs uh, and, and, and vowels. Um, that is more what British people sounded like. So it's the reverse of how, you know, the Spanish colonized different countries and taught them Spanish. And now Spanish speaking countries that were colonized by Spain speak kind of a lesser, you know, in, in the eyes of Spain, a lesser, you know, less grammatical, less perfect version of Spanish. Whereas Britain colonized the U.S. and the U.S. speaks a more original version of Britain and of British English and British English has become more proper because they wanted to differ from the U.S. So it's like, it's such an interesting contrast that British people and everything from, you know, Wales and, and England and, and Northern um, Scotland and, and Northern Ireland, they, they, everything that they do is in contrast to the origination of English, which is still, again, historically, it sounded most like people talk today in the South. Right. So, Carson, I have a question. I've always wondered this. So you're saying, like, the, the founding fathers, for instance, they would have spoken and their English would have sounded more um, like our English today than British English that, that we think of, like with a British accent. Is that right? So it absolutely would have sounded more like us today because British English, as we know it in 2021, sounds nothing like they would have heard 200 years ago. However, it probably wouldn't have the same dialect as we do. Uh, right. You, you look at the Declaration, Declaration of Independence or, uh, and, and, you know, any of it, right? <laughs> the Confederate Papers, uh, even before that, um, they're written in a in a tone in a it kind of the I guess the diction that we don't necessarily use these days the word choice um, however the way that they would say it out loud yeah would be much more similar to what you would hear I guess in it, as historians as, as historians has have put uh, in Nebraska or uh, or Kentucky which again blows my mind to this day to think George Washington sounded like somebody from Nebraska more than he did somebody from, you know, Boston. <laughs> um, really quick, too, I didn't want to uh, cut Jake off. I think Jake might have had a question also. Yeah, I was just going to say, kind of to Carson, your point, I, have, I forget which country you said, with the Dominican Republic that has the half French and half Spanish. Yeah, this Hispaniola half, the west side is... Dominican Republic, and the east side is Haiti. It's, it's such an interesting kind of case of like a almost closed-off experiment, right? Because I think that just kind of goes to show kind of what I see language as a product of like societal development, right? Like almost no biological components in this day and age, I think, are even really relevant. You have to go look back, kind of like what we were saying at the beginning, it's like origin, you know, do we have some sort of, you know, brain or vocal cord development that helped us kind of learn, you know, language better. But like, you know, today it's almost solely kind of a reflection of societal, you know, events, so to speak. Yeah, Jake, yeah. I'm so sorry. I'm... Go ahead, Carson. Did you, did everybody hear him? I, I feel like I, I missed, you know, probably five to seven seconds of, of the middle of what you were saying, Jake. Uh, I heard. I heard Jake. Jake. Which, which part? But I mean, basically, it's just it kind of you know the language is a reflection of society. I, I find that interesting, especially that uh, case that you pointed out in particular was just kind of a very clear example of that. I think no, you also had a good point. I think you also had a good point, though, that I like. I liked a lot. It's more of like an enclosed experiment that Island of Hispaniola. I thought that's huge, and that, like you're talking about, that goes in, and you can do a deep dive on it. How it'll really breed a truly different language, as Carson was talking about the dialect of modern Britain versus uh, old Britain. Um, but yeah, go ahead. My apologies. You contributed, and you're apologizing. Thanks, Travis. <laughs> 
I'm so sorry. I, I, I'm sorry to say anything. I'm sorry. Hey, you're good. You're good. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's, hey. I'm, that's me imitating you. Um, and, and, and it even goes to show cuts, take a step further. It's like, you know, that's why, you know, when kind of, for instance, Brent came over here, or rather we separated from Brent. It's like, you know, against two separate, as opposed to the one control experiment, it's almost two separate ones where we start with relatively the same language. That one, again, that, this one's probably not the best example because we were, like, I guess, purposely changing words, which is pretty funny to me. But, you know, so it, it's interesting how that's like they kind of start at the same spot and they go to different places, being in kind of two different right. societies. Right. Well, man, there's <laughs> this is one of those things, you know, language I, I care so much about. Um, I could spend probably six different sessions on different things, right? Number one would probably be etymology, right? Like, especially if we were just talking about the U.S. or, or Hispaniola even. You know, you know, like I said, I've been there many times. There are different cultures. Like, if we talk about Hispaniola, there's the, the Taino, and that's the, the native people that lived on Hispaniola. They didn't have written language, um, and, and therefore there's no necessarily like a historical evidence, uh, but they still have records. They still have tablets. They still have different, you know, um, explorers that, that went there and wrote things. So the culture itself doesn't have a history of people coming there and affecting the language, but you can see in the, in the papers and the documents and, and the historical records that, you know, people who visited there and, and spent time there, um, they wrote those things and they, they recorded these things, um, over time. And this, you know, we're talking about so, so many hundreds of years ago, like, I don't know at this time, maybe the 1100s, uh, even, even before that, then we would get to a documented history, but the way that they would speak was so disconnected. Right. And I think when we grow up, especially in the U S we have the, the pilgrims and the Indians and it's like, Oh, they came here. And when we're kids, it's like, yeah, they, you know, they taught us how to grow corn and we taught them how to, you know, put a bandaid on something. <laughs> it's, it's uh, a much more disjointed and, and crazy history than that. Um, but language has such a part in that, you know, the ability to communicate with settlers and, and colonizers um, in comparison to the people that actually live there. There's so much history to that. And, and so much, I guess the word I would use, there's so much Creole, right? Um, you look at, Louisiana, you look at Hispaniola, uh, you look at, um, I guess, just French Maritimes, you look at uh, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, you know, southern tip of Africa, uh, the, the Ivory Coast. There's so many mixing cultures that still today have an influential basis on, on how they speak to each other. And that's all based in history and that's all based in language. Um, yeah, something, I, I, I think one of the really interesting, interesting things. Oh, wait, hang um, on, one. One at a time. Travis, you want to go real quick? Uh, sure, yeah. I was just going to bring up kind of a new topic uh, was was the um, the death of a lot of languages. I feel like that's a really interesting topic yeah. that a lot of people hold near and dear, but just because there's such a benefit to, you know, obviously speaking the same language as people you're interacting with, that a lot of, you know, smaller languages have just gotten crowded out. And I think, Carson, you might know the exact stat, but, I mean, obviously, languages exist um for longer you know with, with and then you know smaller languages exist for longer in areas that are very much um like not connected right and so you think of really hilly regions or areas with really thick jungle where the groups just don't meet with each other very often yeah that really breeds tons of different languages because th those groups just don't interact very much because of the geography and so geography is a huge impact on language there's really flat yeah. territories uh with you know wide rivers there's typically only going to be like one or two languages in that area. And so I think like half of the languages, I don't know how many there are, maybe like 10,000 or so. So let's say 5,000 are on just the one island of Papua New Guinea. I think that's right. Just because it's such a, a tough terrain to get through. There's so many different right. subgroups that those languages just haven't died out. Whereas like everywhere else, they've all kind of converged to, you know, English, Spanish, Chinese, et cetera. It's pretty interesting. Man, you are absolutely nailing it. And an, an entire, I, so my thesis that I wrote in college is like 25 pages and about probably eight pages of it is about geography. And I 
personally, I could have written the entire paper about geography. I think it's the most important aspect and, and the most interesting part of, of language. Like, I, I did an entire deep dive in a historical study on how kingdoms affected language in time, right? And you can, you can look at uh, the, the Spanish kingdom or the Roman or the English, whatever, and you can see how language literally is just manipulated and, and coerced through distance. And just from the sheer fact of people being far from another, they don't have, and, and this is, this is based in a lack of technology, right? We are very fortunate in this day and age to have the ability to communicate with each other. I don't know if, again, I'm sorry, I was, I was off for 10 minutes. The most interesting thing you could ever say about language to me when you look at it from a historical spec you know retrospective and, and say you know and, and talk about technology the the question where are you to say to someone where are you that's a new idea that's a new sentence that anyone would ever say up until a couple of years ago in the grand scheme of things, you had to know where someone was in order to say, where are you, right? That wasn't a question that people would ask. You wouldn't write a letter to someone and address it to them and say, where are you? Here's their address. Here's who I'm writing it to. I'm writing it by horse, by carrier pigeon, by telegraph, you know, whatever. These days, the technology has, has so much interconnectivity that we don't actually know where people are. I think that uh, is is horrible and, and beautiful at the same time. But sorry, I, I'm just totally digressing. Geography, like you said, is incredibly interesting um, when it comes to language. There's so much. I wrote so much about that and, and researched. And, and basically, when it comes to modern times or or these days, you can't map it out. But when you look at, you know, uh, ancient times or, or <laughs> however you want to call it, medieval times, blah, 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 whatever time period, um, looking at the epicenter of where the kingdom lied and then going out from there, you can see distinction of language. You can see changing of, of vernacular and, and change in words over time. I um, mean, that's, again, that's <laughs> another, uh, another longer conversation, but very, very true. And, then and I, I think it's um, yeah, Mark, I'll really cool to you too. For um, just going off of that, um, just based off the ge geographical location of where you're at, even if you're within the same country, how language kind of evolves and that kind of brings up accents. You can be speaking the same language in either the U.S., U.K., uh, parts of Asia, and um be talking the same language but have a different accent and the same it's just crazy to me that just because you're in a different part of the country that you have that different accent sure hey car something um yeah, yeah go ahead go ahead guys. sure so just kind of building off things that we think are cool about language uh, i've always found it kind of interesting how you know when you think about language it's a bunch of words strung together in a sentence. And you can kind of think that that might be like infinite, right? You can communicate damn near anything if you just string the correct sequence of words together. But it's kind of a trip to think about that. Everything that language describes is entirely based on our experiences. You can only ever say what has been experienced in the outside world or internally at some capacity, right? Like you can't, describe a sense that only you've developed so if you were the first human to develop sight all the other humans are completely blind how would you how would you describe that experience how would you communicate that you couldn't say i i saw a tree people would be like what well, what's seeing sure carson yeah, i'm gonna one second carson one second bruce i'm gonna go to you next also after um carson answers 
Just quick room reset real quick. Anyone in the audience, if you have anything you want to add at any point, if you want to ask any questions at any point, just raise your hand. We'll, we'll invite you up to the stage. You can, you know, say your piece. And if you don't want to speak and you don't, you know, for whatever reason, you just want to come on the stage but you have questions, just go to my profile, follow the links or, you know, to get to our Discord, hop in there and you can put any questions in the um, questions channel in there and we'll ask them for you. Um, so that they can be answered for you if you don't want to speak. Also, if you haven't already, please, please, please tap that greenhouse at the top. Teach us something cool. Follow our club. We do this every single Wednesday at 830. We'll have you know conversations in between the week. But this is our recorded um, discussion as well. So usually, you know, our best one and a always a good time. So we'd love to have you back in the future. Um, all right. Sorry, I'll let you answer that one, Carson. And then I'll go to you next, Bruce. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Mike. Um, David, I think I think that's honestly a, a common misperception um to be fair i think people you know when you when you grade the time of things you don't necessarily have a word for in your example hey guys i see a tree how do you tell somebody that you can see things if, if everybody else is blind well biologically necessarily we could assume that not everybody was blind but in a way to communicate hey guys look at that the that is something, the that becomes a lexicon, that lexicon becomes an interpretation of whatever, right? So it becomes For sure, something. The, the word look would never have existed in the first place. Right, okay, so hey guys, you know, whatever it is, right, you can, <laughs> you can, you can track back to a blank, hey guys, blank, at blank, and okay, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Eye contact, pointing, gestures, that becomes more about body language, more about verbal, or I'm sorry, nonverbal and, and uh, physical communication than it does about verbal communication, which is, which is language, right? Now, we can get an entire philosophical conversation about language being nonverbal, and I completely agree with you if you want to go into, but being, you know, <laughs> being on this plane of, of talking about, which really, I think that, you know, <laughs> diocese is, is verbal language, um, we're, we're really on the plane of, you know, there is a, an understanding, right? And assuming that the people in, or the, uh, the <laughs> homo sapiens in this scenario can see they are for they sure. Are seeing. But I think it's kind of curious how even through all those different means of communication, I still get the feeling that it would be pretty incomplete. There's always going to be that, that minute difference between saying I saw this tree versus describe you know, with all the other words and all the other senses that you have at your disposal. So no, it really I, seems to be kind yeah. of complete. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree with more with you. And and honestly the the <laughs> the more you dissect that is is really the answer to why didn't we have the internet five hundred years ago? Right? It's <laughs> it's it's a dissection of language and, and a inability to communicate that as humans we have over time become more verbose and, and not necessarily verbose but more detailed and, and more specific right we have there were no adjectives think about the, the fact that there were literally no adjectives when verbal language was created right they would say fire they would not even fire i guess they came up for a word with fire, but they, they would put their hand near a fire and they would say hot they would put their hand near ice and they would say cold whatever those words were right it they didn't say it was extra cold they didn't say it was kind of hot like those words became modifiers because language became and humans became so advanced so i i completely agree with your sentiment that it is absolutely interesting and it is uh something to dissect but it's not necessarily a a stumbling block that you know that that puts a fork in the road for language it's, it's really truthfully the the reason that language took so long you know, I mean, it's, it's human evolution. One, uh, I, I, guess I took, a, oh, sorry. I was going to ask you a question, Carson. Um, cause I took a philosophy of language class in college. I thought it was super interesting. And one of the, oh, you're central, kind of the expert. I'm just kidding. No, no, not at all. It was very <laughs> much a, a freeway class for an easy A, but, uh, I, I, I did think that the class was really interesting. So I just wanted your sure. take on one of like the, the fundamental questions you tried to answer. And that was, 
um, can you express every idea in every language or are there certain ideas that can only be expressed in, you know, one language and not another? Uh, and, and, and specifically like, um, I, I, I guess I'm not going to give an exact example, but like, I, I'm sure you've kind of heard that, that question sure. before, right? Okay, cool. Just wanted to make sure you understood. Wait, so could you explain it more? Uh, yeah, no, I, I completely, uh, I completely understand what you're asking. And, and really I've, I've felt that way all my life. So I grew up, um, very, very, uh, interested in language and that's that's really what led me to where I am today and I <laughs> I do nothing with language most days I, I studied and spoke Spanish um, my whole life my mom studied at the University of Mexico Mexico City um, so I speak Spanish pretty fluently um, as a native English speaker so it's very useful in my life but I can speak French phrases German my dad was on the Berlin Wall. He's very old. He's in his 70s now. I'm, I'm his youngest kid. But anyway, I grew up with him speaking these, you know, he would, I, I would just be four years old trying to do something. He would go, Mach Schnell. I don't know what the hell that means. That means faster. Do it faster. Uh, you know, more quickly, literally. But um, there was those kinds of things where, like, I just grew up with language all around me. Um but however, there are things I, I grew up, one of my best friends growing up was Belgian and they speak Flemish and French. And um, there's not phrases that, that translate. There are, there, I'm sorry, there are phrases that in French, in Flemish, that do not translate at all to English. Um, one of the ones is la pelle de vie. So la pelle de vie is, it really is basically like a, an explanation of it's such a weird thing. It's, it's, and again, it's perfect to what you're asking. You cannot explain this in English in a perfect way where linguistically, cognitively, your mind, if you're only a native English speaker, you won't get it, you know, and, and I'm not cocky enough to say I get it a hundred percent, but I speak enough, you know, minimal French to, to understand it. La Belle de Vine is when you're standing uh, on the top of, a high building if you're if you're on the edge of a cliff or on the edge of a roof and you just have the feeling of like i could fly or or i could i could jump off i i could you know it's not it's not suicidal it's not it's not a death note blah 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 it is just this feeling of like freedom of of just serenity with the balance of the earth blah 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 right it's not i'm not trying to get i, I think i've uh, i think i've read the, about this and some people have described it as like the call of the void is that exactly that's yeah. exactly the translation in english the call of yeah. the void and that if you were to translate it la belle du vide, that means the call of the void it doesn't mean the call of the void in english right if you were to say that if you were on a rooftop with somebody you were like i feel so free i feel like I could just float off this roof. I feel the call of the void. They would go, okay, let's get you to a therapist, right? There's not like, <laughs> to say it in English without explaining it, I feel the call of the void. That doesn't necessarily put it into words. Um, I, that's that's one example. There are absolutely so many examples. Um, one of my other best friends speaks fluent Chinese. He will tell me all the time things in Chinese. I don't know what they mean. I have to look them up all the time. And I will say, is this what you meant? You know, <laughs> I'm like, go, you know, go bathe yourself. And he was like, take a shower. You know, like there's there's no exact tra translation. But there's other times where it's more anecdotal. It's more of an idiom where in English, for someone who is only an English speaker, which... English is one of the most common languages in the world, right? You're, you're pretty good to go around the world. Um, it's not necessarily going to get you far in certain dialects. It's not going to get you anywhere. Um, so, uh, Travis, just I completely agree that there, th with the sentiment that there are phrases that you can directly translate to English that if you only speak English, you won't understand what they mean at all. They're one of my direct. favorite examples of that, just... I think it's absolutely hilarious. In German, is der Kummerspeck, and it loosely translates to grief bacon, and so, it means the kind of weight you put on because you feel sad because you got broken up with. I love that. <laughs> I love that. But that's 
No, but that's that's idiomatic, right? That is that's idiomatic. Like in Spanish, they say uh, "pinta la vaca," right? "Pinta la vaca" means painting the cow. And that what the hell does that mean? Painting the cow in Spanish in, in Spanish culture, that means you're ditching school. You're playing hooky. So that again, that's that's idiomatic. I love you know I love the sentiment, but again, right in in England, uh, they say you know. <laughs> <laughs> the painters are in, or she's on the blah. That means a woman is on her period, but it doesn't mean you know a different thing than what we would know it to mean. Um, again, that's that's idiomatic. Not to again, not to shoot you down. I love, <laughs> I love. No, I, I actually really appreciate that. That I, yeah. I guess that distinction went over my head. But no, no, it's important, it's right? Wrong. It's raining cats and dogs. We know that. You know, we know that means it's thundering outside. But there is a way to say it's thundering outside in a different language, whereas, you know, the call of the void, we say it like that. We don't know what that means in English, but in French, to say it and understand it in, in such a essence really means, you know, here's a five-minute explanation of that, right? But we can't say it. We can't snap and say it in five words. That's that's the difference. And then real quick, so, too, I want to let Bruce ask his question because he's been waiting for a while. So go ahead, Bruce. Yeah, sorry, Bruce. Oh, no, no, it's all good, man. It was a very, very interesting conversation. I'm loving everybody's questions. And uh, so just really quick on, on that, do you think uh, on the on the kind of uh, the, the call of the void example, do you think that the, like the Borg-like quality of English will, will eventually integrate that into becoming an English word where people will say, I wonder what, you know, whatever you said, means, you know, where does it come from? It's an English word. Oh, it's actually from the French. Like, is it? Do you think that that will come in time? I think that's a great question. I think, um, honestly, I hope that it doesn't. I think the <laughs> essence, <laughs> honestly, the essence of language and the beauty of it, um, we've misappropriated it. We've messed it up so much already. I really hope that we don't, right? Like, I, I hope that over time we preserve the, the constitution of different languages, we hope, you know, I really, really, my yeah. passion is that we actually care about different cultures and different people. You know, there's so much uh, division in our in our world right now, where we feel like we we feel like we know everything. Some people, I, I wouldn't say that, but people feel like they understand completely everything that's going on and they have an opinion on it. You don't know how somebody else feels until you can even talk to them in their own language, right? Like going and, and doing I again I've, I've traveled to several countries I speak a lot of Spanish I've, I've spoken you know different I've spoken German and French and, and Korean um, I would never say that I speak, speak the language as well but being able to communicate with someone um, in their own language and trying and putting that effort in is so wholesome it's so it's so humbling you know I would never want for us to take from a different language. It's almost, almost like a tenderness there, too, like when you're it learning is. a language, right? And people are Absolutely. Being overly, like, you don't get that every day. That's very cool. Absolutely. I think, I think it's one of the most important things you could ever do in your life is to at least attempt to speak a different language. You don't have to be fluent. You don't have to be, you know, a, a Britannica translator in order yeah. to get what I mean. But to be able to speak to other people especially like the most special thing about it is speaking to other people in their native language that, you know, is not your own. It's mm. such a, it's, it's, I mean, it's incredible. It, <laughs> there's, there's no way to describe it, but to, to really answer your question, I, I think there may be a point where, you know, we can, we can try as a, as a society, especially as a U.S. society, not really, Pretending to welcome and embrace other cultures, but not really doing so. I hope that we can actually do that. But in terms of language and understanding, I ultimately hope that we can more branch out and try to learn more about others instead of accommodate and figure out, you know, the short way to do things. That, that's awesome. And uh, I'll, I'll recede now, but um, if there's room for another question at some point, I'll... Definitely, yeah. I'm going to let you go again in a second, okay. Bruce. I just want to, because uh, Carson okay. says he, he speaks a little bit of Korean, and that's actually one that I wanted to speak on because we've had 
you know, if you follow Dan Everett's uh, theory that language started with the Homo erectus, right, where it started where with, with the cavemen, um, yeah. we've had 60,000 generations since then of iterations to language. And that's where the mutations happen. We're, that's why we have so many language uh, or so many languages. And I think it was Travis who touched on with Papua New Guinea and the geography um, being such a struggle there and that's kind of what caused so many different dialects to to form so many different languages but korea is a a beautiful example of this that you know helps you understand how a language could mutate um in a short amount of time you know they they split back in 1945 um into north and south korea and obviously you know there's there's a lot of differences there now you've got north korea as the closed market communist society that really hasn't evolved at all. And then you've got, you know, South Korea is this open market capitalist society that is booming, um, really awesome country. So it shows you the nice comparison there. But if you ask them, I forget what the exact statistic is on it. Uh, the dialect in the past, since, well, how many years since 1945, I think it's what, 75, 76 years since then. Uh, it, it's changed so much that they're com like Korean is a completely different language now like if you went to north korea their dialect uh south korean might only understand about 10 percent of it uh and vice versa because the dialect has shifted that that much through two or three generations sure so i'm sorry mike what was the what was the question there there was no question there i just wanted to point it out because you said that you speak a little bit of korean i don't do the questions i don't think it's about korea and if you would like to comment on that um, yeah, no, I can, That's I what I do. Off of that, Mike. I, I yeah, yeah. Um, so there was actually a question that came up from our Discord. Uh, it was, uh, and Carson, this is going to test your knowledge. So, uh, Barry, we go. it is about the the language, uh, the language based off of the geography of the region of Basque, B A S Q. -E, yeah, baby. Written to be the oldest language in the world, the only known language in the world, with no correlation. So, I guess in terms of like uniqueness and how languages can breed their own versions of other languages, as we've seen with Korean, as we've seen with uh, the different the thousands of different languages and iterations of uh, languages in Papua New Guinea. What can you tell us about that? Is there anything you got? I mean, I uh, this is a true test on your deep dive knowledge. So, fire away, man. Yeah, no, Basque, dude, Basque is so interesting. Um, it was basically the, it's so, like, if you if you trace it back, it's Spain and France. Like, it's a, it's an isolate, like, you know, it's unrelated, basically, to anything else. It, it is basically just sitting there, and there is no connection to other languages. That's why... I guess the you know the original languages don't necessarily reference to it. Like when they talk about Latin, they say, "Oh, Latin's a the dead language." If you're a dead language, people don't even talk about it, right? Basque is a dead language. <laughs> um, so it comes from um, the the Basque country, right? The Pyrenees. Um, I'm trying to think of like there were. Um, you know, the native speakers that, that lived in Spain. I've been to Spain um, once. I spent I spent a couple of weeks there, and there are these, like, you know, ancient, like, I don't know, uh, colonies or, or provinces or whatever, and they're all Basque-speaking. Um, so to talk about... Uh, the weirdest thing about this, actually, the reason that I studied Basque, uh, funny enough, was because of the movie Avatar, Um there are all these references to the the Navari in um, Avatar, the movie, and they speak this whole language. And there's Navari and Chitari and blah blah blah. But um, Navari is the name of the, I think the like Basque speaking area originally. So it's the reason that they use that name Navari in the movie Avatar was because it was such a native and, like, outdated and, and distance, you know, kind of thing. They went for basically the, the sense of, look how far we, um, look how far we are from society, um, you know, in order to, to demonstrate, you know, basically futuristic humans versus the, the native colonies. So, um, there, <laughs> dude, Basque is, uh, I haven't I haven't looked at Basque in five years probably, but can I? Well, yeah, the question actually Basque. came from Maddie. Yeah. yeah, she was the one who posted it. There, go. Yeah. So it's kind of a really cool thing actually. Um, so I live in Boise, 
um, which actually Boise has the largest concentration of Basque people in the U.S. Wow. So we actually have a whole Basque block here. Um, I accidentally took a class on it in college, and we learned all about the culture, the language. So Basque is a bunch of sheep herders. Um, the Basque region between France and Spain, just it's so isolated. It's all sheep herders. Um, okay. But it's actually where running of the bulls is, is every year. It's in the Basque region. Um, so it's, it's actually pretty nifty if you look it up. But, yeah, yeah there's cool. Basque, Boise State has, I think, dozens of Basque classes, Basque language classes. Um, they have a Basque festival every year um, where it's just a huge party in the middle of the street. But it's kind of cool. So, I'm sorry, is Basque originating from Boise or is it just like an influence no. there? Um, so when the sheep herders came from the Basque region to the U.S., uh, a lot of them, for some reason, they, migrate, they migrated here. Okay, that makes way more sense. I was like, well, hold on, yeah, <laughs> that doesn't uh, that doesn't make sense because like when I spent time in Spain, they talked about Iberian, um, and there's in Spain there's tons of influence of Iberian, and Iberian is really not like a language or or an effect on society at all anymore. And then you talk about like uh, Catalan, uh, that was kind of a an evolution, you know, of the Iberian Peninsula and, and you know, the Aquitanian or the, however you say that, um, influence on Spanish. So it's interesting that, that Basque could, you know, have uh, an influence then on that. So that's, that's four times removed, right? It goes Basque and then Iberian and then Catalan and then Spanish. Um, and if you were, you know, if you've ever been to Barcelona, the, the king of Spain, you know, in the, I don't know, 1300s I, I can't remember the year um total guess but he had a lisp and he spoke spanish but he spoke it in a weird way he just basically the dialect of the time shortened words made things uh, more more curt and he spoke with a lisp and that was basically uh became a standard um so to think and, and we could talk about Catalan for half an hour, but uh, <laughs> um, going there and, and going to, you know, Barcelona, it's Barcelona, and, and normally, like, exit would be salida, but in Catalan, it's salde, so it's just short and more curt words, more more specific, and, and to think that Basque was more, uh, even shorter than that, more abbreviated, more specific, um, it's it's almost like they decided we didn't need as many words. And again, I don't, I don't know, but I would assume that Bass probably had more words or more meanings for things um, than they did, you know, back in the, the early centuries. Um, and, and then over time, as you can see this in English too, over time, English words become more um, congealed, right? They become more uh, connected and, and they two or three or four words then be become put into one word with several meanings. Um, not to say that that is a better solution, but that's how it happened. Yeah, they actually determined that Basque was, I guess, invented in a sense in prehistoric times. Sure. It's definitely interesting. That's super cool. Yeah, I, I want to read more about Basque. I haven't, um, that's that's all I know is everything I, I pulled out to you is that, you know, I knew it was part of the Pyrenees and the, and the Spanish and the French, but um that's a great great question and i'm not you know i'm not a full historian <laughs> and then uh, i think mike had a question as well and then we're gonna go right back to bruce because i know he's been he's sitting on a heater right now he brought heat the first time so i know he's got more for yeah, us shoot a three. Mm -hmm. okay well mine's not necessarily a question it's more of a uh, gonna switch gears real quick all right going and back to bruce now bring it back what's that going back to bruce um, <laughs> no, go ahead, go ahead, Carl. Jesus. All right, I'll bring a full circle. Um, Love you. Strap yourselves in. This will be all right. Um, if you've seen the Un or Manhunt the Unabomber on Netflix, you know where I'm going with this. Or if you know anything about the Unabomber, it's pretty wild how pretty much this discussion we're having right here was pivotal in the hunt for Ted Kaczynski, a.k.a. the Unabomber. Um, if you don't know his story, he's he's the guy who sent bombs through the mail to, um, 13 bombs through the mail. He's considered a domestic terrorist on the run for 
more than a decade. Um, so basically, he sent anonymous letters to all these people with bombs. It blew up in their face. Um, nobody knew who he was. They had no idea what his profile could be. Was he young, old, like what his race was, what his uh, background was. Um, so they had hundreds of FBI workers over the course of a decade, basically, trying to come up, trying to find this guy. Um, and it's what they use mainly is profiles. And uh, like I just said, they they came up with some, but every department in the FBI that created these profiles so they know who to search for were different. Some would say he's old, some would say he's young, some would say he's foreign, some would say he's domestic. It's They just basically had no idea where to look. And then, so his story was, he, after he did all these bombings, he was on the run for a while. He sent letters to multiple media organizations demanding that they publish his, what is it, like 3,500, 35,000 word manifesto. He wanted to get his, his manifesto out into the world. Um, so they really knew nothing about this guy except for the written language in his letters and in his man, and in his man. In his manifesto. There we go. So one FBI profiler, he was new to the case. Um, <clears throat> he found certain similarities between some words and phrases that were written in his manifesto and in his letters that are not present anywhere else in the world to try to draw an accurate profile on this guy. For example, he used certain spellings of words. Um some words that have double letters um, in his manifestos, they would have one. Or one of the most notable ones is the common phrase, you can have your cake and eat it too, or you can't have your cake and eat it too. In his manifesto, he repeated that phrase backwards, so you can't eat your cake and have it too. And the way they aged the guy was for two reasons. That phrase is because that was... A phrase saying it backwards is technically has not been used commonly for 180 years. It was it started back in Middle English and it was said that way, and somewhere along the line it flipped, and that's just what was common. But since he was he was a very smart guy, high academia, he read old literature, and so he adapted that. Um, some of his phrases they figured out his location, where he's from, because some of his phrases that he commonly used they looked up. Um, the only other places that were used in American media were in Chicago in a certain period by four different media outlets. So they know where he was from. They knew he was smart. The, um, the way he wrote his formatting for his manifesto, so you know how we have like MLA format? Well, he wrote in a different one with very specific punctuation that was very, that was only specific to a sort of formatting present for about four years that was it was declared common so they aged him because they knew he was going through academia at that time so they got his age his location um they knew he was smart and there's a, a list goes on on how um they figured out it was him that was just three i can i could think of off the top of my head they were also used able to use that um language to decipher between you know what are they called the uh the people who Oh, copycat, copycat killers, basically, who mm-hmm. send bombs in claiming to be the main serial killer. When really they're not, they were able to use his language by that. Um, and finally, the thing that gave it away is his brother actually noticed the language that he used in his manifesto was the same type of language that his mother used. Mm-hmm. And that's actually what gave them the warrant to search his little hut that he had in Montana, finding bombs. Finding, uh, finding him to be the serial killer. And so you're saying so, that his language that he uses in his manifesto is, or his vernacular for that matter, is what gave him away ultimately? Correct. Correct. And what's the what's and, the take on it? Oh, go, go finish your thought. So no, I'm just saying this relates back to what we're talking about, how little iterations of language in, by region or by time period um, kind of have a real world example on today if that makes sense. Like, we're, we've been discussing the evolution since the beginning, but even in a macro sense, it's a very small window. I mean, 180 years is nothing in, in 
term, in like the long term, right? It's a very small portion, but that little deviation of language in that short period of time was able to be used to ca- capture a serial killer, and I found that incredible. Hey, Mike, when when was he captured? What year? Do you know? I think ninety five. Okay, interesting. I think. Yeah, man, that's great. I'm I'm uh, I'm from Newfoundland, and if a Newfoundlander ever wrote a letter like that, I'm sure they would find out that he was from here really quick. So <laughs> right. <laughs> What's the what's the take on his manifesto? Like, is it more like a uh, like a Mein Kampf kind of manifesto, where it's just mindless blabbering because it's Hitler in jail, or is it like a Karl Marx like communist manifesto, where it's actually well constructed thoughts, um, you know, throughout? So, based on the reviews I read online, plus the uh, the show slash documentary on Netflix, there's two things, two takeaways. One, he has legitimate thoughts on the world. Um, they're well-formulated thoughts on... So the title of the manifesto is Industrial Society and Its Future. So it's very intellectual to the point, and so they said, where not many people can get through reading the whole thing, first try comprehending the whole thing. Even even high scholars could not read through it the first time and understand it. It's something you have to reread, look up definitions, look up concepts, things like that. Like, just his thought process is hard to follow? Like, it's just too many thoughts strung together? Or it's just, like, his his vocabulary is too too advanced where you're just having to stop and try to understand all the words and what he really intends for them to mean? Exactly. No, like second thing. Gotcha. It's just, it's just so advanced that the average person cannot grasp the concepts right away. Um... Oh, go ahead. It, Mike, kind of comes from a crazy person, more. and you can tell in the in the manifesto, but they are legitimate, well thought out thoughts. But they're pretty crazy. What yeah, was the other the takeaway, way. Mike? You said there were two takeaways. Oh no, that they were legitimate thoughts from a crazy person, and that it was really hard to read. Oh, he gosh. was really smart. His IQ was well above the average. I want to let uh, Carson respond if he has a response to you, Mike, and then I'm going to let Bruce uh, ask his question. Yeah, um, I, I guess a few things to say there, Mike. That's uh, very interesting and, and um, I guess, well thought out, you know, interpretation of, of everything. And, you know, I guess to, to comment first, you know, I think just to be safe, uh, the, the Unabomber was – uh, a megalomaniac, right? He was, he was insane. Oh, yeah. he, he absolutely had like delusions of grandeur. And really, I think, um, one of the, not, I'm not necessarily like a pop culture guy all the time, but one of the most influential, you know, kind of, I guess, proof in the pudding moments is, uh, to say that this guy the Unabomber cared so much about notoriety, right? He wanted to be known. He wanted to be forever in the history books. But when you say the Unabomber, a lot of people, especially, you know, in 2021, will know who you're talking about. You know, to say what was the Unabomber's name, um, a lot of people don't know that. So, again, to reference pop culture, you know, in <laughs> in Goodwill Hunting, he says, "Hey, who?" He he just says to uh, whatever the guy's name is. Can't remember the actor, but he says to Robin Williams, "Hey, who is Ted Kaczynski?" And he goes, "I no 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 idea." He says, "No fucking idea." And then he says, "Hey," to the bartender, "Ted Kaczynski, who is that?" The bartender goes, "You're a bomber." So, you know, <laughs> the the no the notoriety, right? This this feigning genius um, was all about media. It was all about knowing a name. And I, I, I would just, you know, again, everything that you said was correct, but to call him a genius and, and incredibly high IQ, it may be factually true, but I also think it pokes holes in the sense of our standardized testing or, you know, our, our measure of what a smart person is. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, you're a, you're a good person. If you're smart, I know you're not saying that. Um, but everything that you're saying, uh, is, a, is incredibly true, especially about the, um, the, the linguist. That was the only part that I, everything you said, you know, I'm familiar with, but 
but the the fact that a, a linguist uh, linguistics pers- professor um, identified the Unabomber and, and could you know predict where he was from that's that's all I had read about previously and that was um, incredible right that's from what I remember he, he basically picked apart his words and even just like not even just diction the words that he chose to use in a census but but the you know the the subtext and and everything that and, and the syntax. I mean, subtext and syntax. <laughs> but but choosing to use words in a certain order, um, and, and and even analyzing it on a granular level to say, you know, I will be with you instead of you'll be with me, to identify a differentiation, you know, in those two things, and then categorize that by region and, and break it down into a geographical you know kind of layer it's it, it's incredible um it took them like you said right it took them like eight years to find him from the time that he wrote his last letter I, there's so much to be studied there it's it's so just blown away when he got nailed but this is why i love clubhouse <laughs> yeah exactly exactly boom <laughs> language so uh hey real quick, I love clubhouse, i'll say one because, thing yeah, go ahead. Okay, sorry. Um, Carson, to your point where IQ doesn't necessarily mean you're a good person, one of the first, um, one of the episodes at the beginning of this series points out that he was growing up, he's actually a really like, smart, um, he went to Harvard, good kid, and then he joined, you know how in college they, you can be part of studies. I know and when I was at school. Yeah, yeah, they wanted you to be, a, especially for the social psychology department, they want you to yeah. go in and answer surveys, things like that. Well, he did one at, at Harvard, um, or I think it's Harvard, whatever school. Well, at Harvard, they're and, called the finals clubs. Right, okay. Um, I didn't go to Harvard, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that either. I think you're referring to finals clubs. No big deal. <laughs> <laughs> Harvard. Just get it right, Mike. <laughs> so the, the the test was where he would gain um, the professor would gain his trust and he would start to have Ted open up to the professor with all his life goals ambitions thoughts in the world um, basically in Ted's eyes it was somebody who's finally realizing his 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 like smart intelligence somebody who's listening to him um, he gains a trust a rapport a, a, a friendship with this professor. Sure. And then the professor goes, okay, so why don't you have, um, write down some of your thoughts, come up with like some logical topics that you'd like to express with the world, and we'll have other Harvard professors sit around and um, listen to your take on this. And remember, this is coming from a position of trust, a position of like right, right. basically an Inter- artist yeah. sharing their art with the world. Yeah. And the study person who's running the study told all the professors to just absolutely shit on every idea he had call him stupid call him like how are you yeah. in this school like you're an idiot um basically sending ted into a a mental spin and that was the point of the study now you later find out in that episode that that study was actually contracted out by the fbi and the results were used on how to manipulate and brainwash um like suspected terrorists and to sure. uh, get information out. Yeah. Get information out of suspected terrorists, brainwash spies, a, things like that. They had Twitter back then. <laughs> That's yeah, right. So exactly. one could say that the FBI screwed him up, he bombed everybody, and then the FBI caught him again. I don't know. That's all I'm saying. That's pretty weird, weird twist. That is a crazy twist. Yeah, that is. that, I mean, It makes sense. I mean, it's almost like the equivalent of like, Oh, man, I hope he doesn't watch this on YouTube, but I had a barber back in the day who made music on SoundCloud, and it is, like, I've showed some of my friends, and it is trash, but the dude cut a mean fade, so I'm in there every two weeks just hyping him up. I'm like, oh, dude, that new song, it's like, the, he's got, you got, you know, you got to rapport with him. Like, you can't, I'm not going to, I'm not going to shoot him down. He's going to cut some terrible fades on me. And then meanwhile, like, he's dropping these songs on SoundCloud and Spotify and thinking he's getting, like, all these listens. Like, I know he's buying the listens, but he doesn't know that I know that. I'm like, dude, this music is so trash. 
Like, who's, who really listens to this? Like, who listens to this? Like, how do you listen to this yourself and just re release this? It's kind of that same thing where you're just kind of, he released them to the lions and uh, they just, they, they intentionally were mean to him. Whereas, like, me hyping my barber up to be a good friend, like, it might not be a good friend after all because he's going to find out sooner or later that his music is trash, either by someone telling him or no one listening to him. Yeah, yeah, 100%. It's like uh, you, you can die a little death every day by, by hearing that you suck. A little less, a little less, or else you could just go up in flames <laughs> one day. Yeah, that's the truth, man. Can you imagine? Can you imagine like being friends with or being neighbors with like a creepy Ted in the seventies? Because you have fucking Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, and you got Ted Bundy, the serial killer. You got. <laughs> I mean, don't don't know what bad Ted, time to be a Ted. Yeah, really bad time to be a Ted. I think Ted. You know, <laughs> until How I Met Your Mother, there was no, there were no central Ted's for a while. <laughs> no, I think that you made a good point too, Mike, about, you know, I don't want to make this a discussion about the Unabomber, but the intelligence thing, right? You know, I think Carson made a good objection to where it's like you, you call him a genius and, you know, there's a lot of intelligent people out there. And what you'll find with a lot of them is, you know, well, one, not all of them are ethical. You know, they're, they're going to abuse their power in the form of intelligence to either manipulate people or, you know, just do some serious evil stuff. Um, I would say half and half is, like, really generous. Yeah. I mean, there are so many intelligent people out there, but to say that, you know, not all of them are nice people, you know, Mike, no, you know, no offense. But <laughs> no, 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 I, you're good. <laughs> I think that's very generous to say. I would say most people use their genius for bad right it's, right it's you know <laughs> it's just the the way of the, the majority world. i, I would agree with that psychology and sociology oh, here we the go. majority do so. and you know so he's not a genius right he's very intelligent but the what he was doing too and, and how he was writing to make it unique is something that you find with you know highly intelligent people who are looking to manipulate people into thinking that they're way smarter than they are they use big words they start you know wording things confusingly to make you think about it like you don't understand what they're saying they're going to keep going on with their thoughts and you know you're going to think they're they're even more intelligent by doing that so i think it's just you know a manipulation tactic and how he wrote this stuff to make himself unique um to make people think that he's smarter than he really was not discrediting his intelligence but he's not i wouldn't go as far to call him a genius you know his tactics are something <laughs> don't, that we see don't, don't you know, worry about offending mike mike are you offended that uh the unibiber might not be a genius <laughs> mike uh, your no. opinion was a fucking piece of shit take so <laughs> yeah, I, 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 mike, if you don't agree with me i'm gonna leave right now really? no, bruce bruce uh i want you to ask your question you've been you've been waiting super patiently i appreciate that uh thanks sir. no problem okay so i had a quick uh try to make a quick question for you about uh, something that you said that, that gave me pause made me think so you got so you got language changes at different speeds right so you got the the the, the very abrupt kind of political change like webster coming in and doing it as an act of political whatever political revolution whatever and you've got like the slow morphological change of of like laziness versus utility and like words like covered you know, cupboard and whatever. And I'm just wondering, so those are like, those are kind of what I was saying, like very slow and very fast. You said something about pre-adjectival languages. And I'm just wondering, do you think that the change from pre, sorry, pre-adjective um, ch changes? Uh, no, make up words, man. Go ahead. This is what cool. this is about. Yeah, right on. So <laughs> pre-adjectival. It's all about the sound sex of it. Anyway, the um, pre-adjective. Exactly. Pre-adjective. And, um, did, did that change from pre-adjective, or do we know, from pre-adjective to adjective? So t two questions. Did that happen more on the fast side, like when it ran into a different culture that had adjectives, or did it happen on the very, very slow side? And just as like a tail question on that, you know how you hear like this place has 30 words for snow? Is that just because, is that is that like, do those languages not have the adjectives there? Those are my two questions. Thanks, man. Yeah, no, that's great. First question, um, I think, honestly, that was more of a slow change. I think that, that adjectives came about be 
simply because of need, right? And I, I think adjectives are a tool in language, like physically, a lot of things are tools physically. So, you know, <laughs> we, we created a, you know, candle lighter or, a, or a, uh, you know, a match because we needed to ignite flames more easily. We created adjectives um, to describe things because we needed to depict and, and you know, color words more easily um and that came over time that wasn't like oh okay all of a sudden we're going to be describing things and even you know when when you say fast i know you, i know you don't mean 10 years I, you know it could mean 100 years that would be really fast yeah, yeah. Uh, to all of a sudden be abjecting language um but i think over hundreds of years you know we have um the distinction of of different nouns um becoming more prominent Right, it becomes something that we say. Uh, this this makes sense to describe something as uh, you know more than blank, right? More than it's it's not just tall; it's really tall, or you know, it's not just blue; it's you know really dark blue, you know, like whatever it is. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. There's, there's millions of adjectives, but. <laughs> um, there is such a I think in my in my perspective from what I've um, from what I've seen it's, it's adjectives have been around for a very long time you know they adjectives have existed since Latin um, and, the, and they really just are there to modify you know different words mm-hmm. um, there's a whole again again if we if we do a really long conversation about etymology I could spend 20 minutes talking about adjectives and adverbs uh, and you know determiners and <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, adjective phrases and blah blah blah. Yeah, um, I was one of the only kids in my university who who actually took the <laughs> took the grammar and the advanced grammar course. Everyone was like, "Yeah, oh, that shit's interesting." Yeah, yeah, it is. No, it is. Um, and then your second question, uh, remind me again, what was it? Uh, I, it was about. Do you think that the I don't even, you know, it might be a question just rooted in misunderstanding of mine. But I, I was talking about those those languages that have many, many words for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, are, are those generally thought of as pre-adjective languages, or is it just totally they could be totally uh, parallel, whatever? So honestly, on on the languages that I've studied, which is is pretty um, selective, but you know, English, Spanish. German, French, Korean, um, Latin, I, I don't know, probably a total of 10. Um, there, it's really a case-by-case basis, right? There are languages where uh, something became something, like, you know, if we were just based something up, right, like, uh, like whatever you said, snow, there are different words for snow because of the timing and it just happened it was happenstance that somebody said oh that looks like snow and somebody what does that mean and blah 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 and then in a different region it became that way but i think 80 percent of the time it was geographical um but there is like i talked about earlier in in in, um i can't remember that was travis or tobin who, who referenced the geography of language um it is incredibly defined by you know how we describe uh, something and and incredibly defined by the you know monarchy at the time. So basically, when you know somebody was <laughs> describing something, like if, especially if you look at like Latin, like somebody was to say something. If we took a if we took a word in Latin, like uh, I don't know, if we took uh, let me think, like um, pes, like. The word pes, P-E-S, that means foot. And uh, in common sense, pes is a verb translated to English as pedal. So to say, okay, pedal your feet. But pedal becomes, you know, from the word, it it became pedal from the word foot. And P-E-D, ped, in same, you know, in in one and the same, like from any love language, French or Spanish or or whatever, um, it became that from the word pest. So to say that, you know, 
<laughs> bikes were invented and then everyone in that country that knew about bikes said, okay, pedal your feet. No, obviously that didn't happen. There were different ways that they said, you know, to pedal. Um, and, and, you know, there's no, I, I, I can't think of it. I can't just make up a distinction of, of whatever that was, but just to think of that, even still in Latin, they were saying pes, which meant foot, which meant pedal in, in direct translation there's not necessarily a, a word, you know, to, to transcribe in every, you know, different language in the world, but it, it goes beyond time and beyond geography to mean different things. So uh, <laughs> I would love to, I guess, draw like more of a, um, a graph to, to see how words change over time. Yeah, Carson, um, what, what was it maybe... Uh, maybe you don't know, but there's a there's a word, there's a name for exactly that phenomenon. As as you know, words take on kind of new meanings and sounds depending on where where and when they are. What's the word for that kind of uh, verbal evolution? Uh, Before you answer that or Google that, I just want to say thank you very much. I got to head out, and uh, thanks to all of you guys. It's a great room. Good meeting you, Bruce. Thanks, Hope to Bruce. see you next week. Thanks, Thanks Bruce. Bruce. Hey, Bruce. Right. Thank you, Bruce. Bye. So speaking of Google, if you Google Ted Kaczynski IQ, the first one that comes up with an IQ of 167, Kaczynski was a certified genius. Yeah, here it comes. Yeah. Bam! Bam. A pretty big Kaczynski guy. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Die on your hill or you want it was a shit take to begin with, Mike. So go ahead, Carson. <laughs> 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 No, whoever, I'm sorry, whoever asked that, uh, great question. I, I don't, I, I completely know what you're talking about. I don't know the word for when words take on a new meaning. I, I mean, I would say they, they evolve, you know, they morph, they, uh, <laughs> they, I guess, tracked over time. Um, so if, unless anyone else has a question, I'm going to wrap things up here really quick. I did want to ask you one more thing, though, going all the way back to the caveman, Carson, if you know anything about it. Uh, the, was it, Maka Ponsgat Pebble? Have you ever heard of that? Say it again? Maka Ponsgat Pebble. It's, like, from a tribe in, like, South Africa uh, from way back when. Uh, the Australotha... Yeah, Australopithecus is, is the uh, the tribe, and basically that's like the first known, going all the way back, coming full circle now, symbol um, that they can point back to where they, they can tell the culture of the tribe had deeper meaning of the symbol, because it's a stone that is found, like, the closest you can find that variety of stone is like 20 miles away from where their cave was located, that they had their, their tribe or their village, um, Showing that like one of them had to have picked it up and they needed to transport it and they kept it safe in the cave and it, uh, you know make, yeah they just kept it safe in the cave because it meant something to them and on that stone what makes it unique I'm gonna share a, a link in the Discord as well right now it's actually pretty fucking funny um, the stone it naturally has like a smiley face carved on it but at the same time like it looks like a piece of shit and um, hang on I'm gonna change my scene over here so people watch this can see it but yeah like i'm gonna put it in the discord check it out uh basically that's the first known symbol to any uh any species whether it be humans or whether it be um cavemen and yeah it's got like a smiley face on there but it looks like that like og smiley face uh t-shirt i think the nirvana one um like it's not like a human face but yeah they kept it safe. It was sacred to them. Um, so it's the first known symbol that we have of them that isn't like a tool or something. It's just like this is an icon and it has deeper meaning to us. So check that out on the Discord. Yeah, yeah. Just look this up, man. I've seen this before. I I haven't looked at this. I haven't looked at this for like eight years, <laughs> but definitely uh, familiar. Because um, the, the the whole reason that it's significant is because it was like the uh, the um, Manaport or whatever it's the you know the fact that they found an object f far away like you alluded to like it's far away from where they found significance of life right that was the right. whole the whole point was like somebody it wasn't just naturally occurring it was because like there are random smiley faces occurring in nature just 
coincidentally, but this was like, it seemed to actually apply to and, and connect to, uh, you know, whatever, um, I guess the, <laughs> the, you know, the, the civilization at the time. It was like, it was 3 million years ago is when it appeared. So that's one crazy to even fathom, you know, the, the, yeah. uh, Homo erectus species, they were around for 2 million years and Homo sapiens, us, we've only been around for 200,000 years. So 3 right. million years ago is when this thing was found. And, you know, I, I just can't imagine being on that hunt where one, Homo erectus species kind of looks at the other and like probably grunts or something like this kind of looks like us. <laughs> it's just it's hey, crazy. Mike, um, real quick before you close out, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure everyone in this, except for Carson, probably knows that we do a coffee hour in the Discord. Just talk everything, teach us something cool. Um, so if you haven't joined the Discord, join up. And uh, yeah, today yeah. was great. If you haven't fun. already. Go ahead and follow our club on here. Teach us something cool. Tap that greenhouse up top. I'm going to let you talk really quick, Mark, and let me just wrap this up here. Uh, the coffee hour, you know, we're going to discuss that. We're going to set the topic for next week. Like I said, the purpose of this is it's like a book club, but for learning cool shit every week. Um, so we're going to set the topic in there for next week, and then we're going to set the topic for the week after that as well to give us all some more time to prepare in the future. And, uh... Thanks for contributing, Slater. Really appreciate it. <laughs> Dude, I was, I was driving the whole time. And then I was eating dinner, and, and like, we were, we were getting towards the end here, and I was like, wow, they, honestly, they did a great job. I'm just going to listen. I was just like, I'm just an interested listener. No, I okay. lied to everyone, okay? Uh, it was amazing. I was listening, too. I really enjoyed this clubhouse. Um, really enjoyed it. Definitely learn something cool. Uh, Mark, I'm going to let you ask the final question or say the last remarks, and then I'll, I'll officially wrap up here for us. I have one more that I need expert opinion on after that. Though. Okay, all right. We got, we got a two we got a two question queue. Do I have any no, other takers? I just wanted, I just wanted to say, um, one, um, one, we appreciate you guys joining Brad and Undy um, in this, uh, or Undy in this conversation. <laughs> Oh, and, you, you, uh, I don't think you said the name say, right. You said Brad, yeah, right? Yeah, no, that's sure. why. I, I know. That's why I had to go there. <laughs> go, go ahead. <laughs> sorry. Are you you got you gonna wrap this up? Um, <laughs> go ahead. You guys, you're making me laugh, dude. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you have anything to say, um, feel free to say it now. Um, but we do appreciate you guys joining in. Yeah, raise your hand. And we'll bring you up here. We don't bite. Um, Travis. Uh, yeah, and last but not, not most least, most importantly, Carson, there is a right or wrong answer to this question. So please, oh, okay. I hope that your your expertise can answer correctly. All right, so is it kitty corner or caddy corner? Like, what the hell's up with that? Right, it's on. kitty corner. Okay, there you go. Perfect. That's all I need to hear. <laughs> all right, wrap it up, Mike. Wait, I saw Travis, other Travis, on mute also. Did you have something you wanted to add, Travis? Uh, I, yeah, whenever you're talking about the tribe, I just had one uh, more interesting fact uh, about language. I'll, I'll be quick, but there's a tribe, I think it's in Africa also, and you just reminded me of it, Mike, but they, um, this goes back to the question of, like, is language a tool, or is it something that actually affects us as people and, like, changes biologically who we are and so there's this tribe that doesn't have words for uh relative direction like left and right they only use cardinal directions and so they would say like move you know your hand to the north of your face instead of like in front of your face and because of that uh, because they only use cardinal directions they have like an insane ability to detect direction at any time like they always know which way is true north um and they've even done studies where they, like, will take them to a dark warehouse and, like, turn them around a million times and then, like, take off a blindfold and they'll still know, like, which way is, is true north. So it's, it's super interesting how, like, the language they speak ends up impacting their, their physiology in such a way to where, like, they are – they have, like, actual biological differences to the, the vast majority of humans just because of the language they speak. Legitimately um, built different. Yeah. yeah uh, can you actually not, throw I, a I, link? I would argue, Mike, not – built different but but you know that's nature versus nurture right like right humans can do incredible things but that's that's really cool travis that's uh 
that's one of those things where, you know, <laughs> you know, you look at like monks or, or you name it, you know, there's, there's so many things that humans can do so many things when we don't have these distractions or these, uh, I guess some people would say disabilities, right? These mm-hmm. social media and, and distractions that change us. Uh, Travis, can you throw a link in the links and resources in the Discord? So I want to read more on, on that tribe for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Let me go and try and find um, it. I, I, it's like a super deep memory of that fact. Uh, and, and I only got That's my dope, videos though. of yours. So yeah, let me let me try and dig something up. I'll send it in there. That's cool, man. Like, think about like the, you know, the monks that there, there are people that can literally light themselves on fire and they have so much mental control that they don't feel it. They just are so not even proud, but just so determined and, and so much belief in what they feel that that's their form of protest or even like, you know, the, there are tribes of people that can slow and cut off their breathing. And they put a guy in a, you know, uh, airtight, complete, you know, oxygenless container and he shut his brain off and, whatever it was, it was like 10 minutes and they took him out and woke him up and he was good to go. He breathed and he was alive. It was like no what? human hold their breath for that long. That kind of thing. It was like, that's a whole other conversation about your mental capacity and your physiology have so much ability that are untapped uh, in the common world. This is starting to turn into like the space conversation where we just get hit yeah. with cool shit and we're like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, dude, we have to do we have to whole we have to do a whole thing about the Fermi paradox. Let's read up on that. I oh, on that. dude, I'm in on that for sure. We've been talking about. Dude, I have a video that I watched the other it. week. It's so good. I'm already I'm already well read on it. It's well, incredible. I'm definitely down to do that as well. I am going to do this because we're we're two hours in. Um, Carson won. Thank you so much for joining us. Would love to have you join us in the future on Wednesdays. I know it's typically drunken wine night or drunken game night, but, um, you know, yeah, you definitely added a lot of great shit to this discussion and discussion wouldn't have been this good without you. I definitely did not want to be the expert myself. So that was uh, awesome. So thank you again. Those of you who don't know Carson, shoot him a follow, connect with him on on his other social media out here. Um, Super dope dude. Only hung out with him like one time in my life pretty much. But you know, those, those people, those moments you hang out with someone or you remember where you are in certain moments. Dude, I was with him and Michael Jackson died. Like that that's is right. Oh my God. I was just going to say that the that's time crazy. that I hung out with you was when I was at your house <laughs> and we saw on the news that Michael Jackson died. The, when somebody asked me, where were you at Michael Jackson? I was at fucking Mike Lowe's house. I think that was like kind of our cue. Of like we, we just could never hang out again. Cause we're just hey, going to lose another icon. What's up? And I think Travis too. Um, Pepe lives. <laughs> uh, yeah. Inside right. jokes. Okay. All right. All right. All right. So, all right, guys. Shout out, uh, Laxum for coming up with this week's topic too. Yeah. This is a really good yeah. topic. Seriously, everyone, migrate to the Discord after this. We're going to do our coffee hour yeah. discussion and you know talk about uh, what we want to talk about next week and the week after. And I'd love for that one of those to be the Fermi paradox. I think would yeah, be dope. Yeah, get that in there. I'll be there. And then, right, uh, yeah, but... I'm, I'm sold on the Bernie Paradox. Let's do it. Yeah, I'm in. All right, well, we'll we'll wrap this up and we'll get in the Discord and we'll solidify things right after this. But I'm gonna wrap up the video. People have watched me drink four bottles of water so far and take a bathroom break, and I gotta go to the bathroom again. Um, anyway, guys, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for contributing as part of this discussion. Great discussion, another great week. Looking forward to next week. We'll get that set up tonight. Um, we'll announce it in the Discord. We'll announce it on social media. We'll do a better job of you know getting consistent with that moving forward. But yeah, everyone, say goodbye to each other. Love y'all. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Peace.